So welcome everyone to the second half of our sort of two-part discussion of adaptive leadership for peace. And uh, thank you very much, Miho, for the opportunity to, to run these two seminars and for all of you coming back to this uh, second. And you will recall that I, I laboured last time and actually imposed upon you a lot of ideas and lists and checklists. And uh, you know how much I like my checklists. And I said that this time we'd focus on um, some case studies, which would try and amplify that. And that's exactly what I intend to do. So this cases seminar isn't going to introduce new material, new ideas. I'm going to remind you of the ideas that I presented last time. It's a real interest of mine this year, working on this concept of adaptive leadership and how it can transform peace processes, in my view. And uh, so that's my interest at the moment, and that's what I'm sharing with you. So the aim of the cases seminar then is to look at three case studies, which highlight from my experience, and I can speak for these three as a participant in, in active peace operations. And I wanted to share with you and draw down my experience and how they've informed my, my particular approach to all the literature and theories on, on leadership. The three cases that I'm going to talk about were, were hugely disruptive for humankind in a variety of ways and contexts. Um, and I may have suggested some of them last, last time, but I'm going to look at the Palestinian intractable conflict in the Middle East, which you know the British probably started by drawing its Balfour line in the, in the, in the sand many, many uh, decades ago, but is, is a, a very difficult um, peace context and conflict context. And I'd like to look at that. And I spent uh, nearly two years of my life in that arena as a as a, a junior advisor at the time of trying to implement the Oslo Accords. And I'll talk a, a little bit about what I learned about the frustrations and how in with insight now, I'm much more experienced and older and read more, how I might have looked at things differently. Secondly, I'm going to look at the experience in Aceh. Aceh in Indonesia, far less well known on the global conflict stage, but um, well known because in 2004, five at Christmas time, there was a dreadful tsunami, which killed a quarter of a million people in 20 minutes and actually took place at a, at a point in the history of Sumatra, northern Sumatra, Aceh sits at the top of the uh, Indonesian archipelago, which there had been a very bitter and hard fought civil war between secessionists and the Java government of Indonesia. And the tsunami came at a time, at a pivotal time, and, and changed the context of the peace uh, process and the peace pursuit in Aceh. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And the third is, is our own more local case of the north of Ireland, which is interesting, very contemporary terms, because how external events such as the uh, withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union has rekindled interest and focus and indeed risk. And I think there's an issue here, another lesson we can learn from this case on some of the ideas of adaptive leadership. So in this session, I'm going to very briefly remind us of what we talked about. I'm going to look at uh, the principles and how they convert, but I'm going to concentrate most of my time on a few recollections, if I may, and we'll have more time this week for, for conversation. Next slide is the first reminder. The notion that adaptive leadership can help when difficult contexts exist. Um, and I'm arguing in, in, in my current research that it's a critical skill for anyone looking for systematic change. Leaders have to acquire different ways of relating to the environment in which they work. And we could apply, of course, as it has been, adaptive leadership to business, to local economic development, to um, all sorts of community issues. But my interest in research is applying it entirely to peace and to the construction of more peaceful relations between um, conflict, uh, sides of conflict. Remember, in your peace studies, it's, it's often the case that 
we don't actually resolve many issues. We just learn to live with them. So peace is defined in a sense as the removal of tensions of conflict and so forth. But our broader interest in positive peace is that we should build a world in which peacefulness is the default. And that requires, I think, a continuous and, and uh, ever moving commitment to leadership. Leadership defined not by leaders, one or two people with charismatic and authority, but actually a process where um, a whole uh, complex stakeholder uh, network can move things forward. So even the more junior people can be leaders at certain points in that process. We saw that I've based a lot of this on, on Ron Heifetz's work, and indeed he's been a, a huge help and critique of some of my, my work this year. And uh, his, his work really has based on experiences at public leadership and with corporate leadership. He hasn't worked yet, although I'm trying to persuade him to work on peace. Next. So in, in the thinking about this, remember my context and the new bits of thinking. I've tried to introduce this notion of waging peace because it relates so strongly to us when we think about waging war. Waging war, often uh, we know, is about planning, is about mobilizing resources, is about strategy and tactics, it's positioning of troops and of boats and of instruments of war. And there's a huge industry that goes into waging war. And my challenge always has been, why don't we have the same in the industry going into waging peace? And the, the extent to which we have to be thorough in planning and we have to be committed to the long term, we have to allocate resources, we have to think much more, uh, in much more clever ways about uh, what we're trying to achieve. So adaptive leadership, as we saw last time, focuses really on these three things, uh, four things. One, that it acknowledges up front that the world isn't simple, it's very complex. And so part of leadership has to be good at navigating complexity. It's important, secondly, that it's not navigated in a brutal, uh, self-interested way, but navigation combines with empathy to get some form of uh, sensitive to other people and other views approach. It's, a, it's a, an approach to leadership which says you don't get it right, so you keep trying and you keep making mistakes, you learn through self-correction and through reflection, and ultimately it's about trying to create win-win solutions. So the interesting notion about a win-win solution is that there will be many sides and many uh, successes, but there'll also be potentially losses. And adaptive leadership is um, as much about managing loss as it, it is about managing uh, gain. So I want you to bear these in mind. I won't expect, of course, you to remember them as we wander through the cases. But these are the strong conclusions from my early reviews and research that I'm now beginning to develop uh, more systematically through the application of case studies. And the, the first sort of phrases will do for now. And these are qualities of leadership more likely to be conducive to peaceful uh, communities and to peace building. Firstly, that leadership asks different questions, doesn't ask the obvious questions. And it's not the case that leadership always knows the right questions to ask. I'll give some examples of this as we go through the cases. So just bear them in mind that leadership secondly works with complexity that leadership cultivates trust and it's agile and adaptable. So we're saying that these are four hugely important qualities that more successful leadership approaches will have in peace building. Asking the different questions because we don't know what the right question is, dealing with very complex situations, seeing the power of language and asset of trust and the importance of being agile and adaptable. Next slide, Gwyneth, is the other four. There are eight in this checklist. Leadership that's more likely to create peace is about the engagement of the whole. 
not bits and pieces, not solving this little problem over here, but looking at the whole, a very holistic approach. Secondly, as mentioned already, that leadership that manages loss is going to be more successful. So that when you recognize that someone has to give something up, then focus a lot more attention on that. That's a big loss and that resides in uh, communities after the case. We mentioned last time the important relationship between the very local and the global. There are rarely peace contexts which aren't global in implication and impact, even though they're very local in terms of their intensity and their sources. And finally, the point that I've repeated, that leadership is more likely to be successful if it continuously learns. So those eight principles you can go back to um, and, uh, and review. And I'm going to try and draw from my case studies some very strong experiences that I had looking at um, these. These case studies aren't developed in a research approach to justify this. I'm just very fortunate to have a little goldfish bowl or two that I can go and dip into to draw out insights from my own experience, uh, as well as from the experience of many others that I read. So the first one is in uh, Palestine. And uh, there's a couple of images here, one that's very much uh, uh, more, more familiar to you. And that is that global leadership mobilized to resolve some of the worst conflicts uh, that was happening in Palestine at that time. You'll know the situation. I don't have to describe the context, um, but the Israeli-Palestine conflict actually has its origins many, many, many decades ago and came to a fall with the reassertion of independence, principally by the arrival of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO as it was called, largely dismissed as a terrorist organization by um, the predominant powers in a Cold War world uh, at that time, who felt that they were going to be destabilizing a world that was itself rebuilding after um, the traumas of the Second World War, the emergence of the United Nations. But the most important ingredient of all that it was likely to disturb not even the state of Israel, which was a commitment, of course, by the world uh, uh, to, to the post-war uh, reassessment of, of relations and context, but to oil. And oil and energy happens to be coincidentally right in the same place. So the, the problems of the Middle East were a problem for us all because of the um, associations. So you'll know the context. This is an intractable problem. In, in a sense, uh, because of the, the lines of division were not local at all, but they're actually global. And as we've seen subsequently, most of the discussions about the problems of the Israeli-Palestine, Palestine-Israeli conflict was that um, <clears throat> the, they couldn't be solved locally because they had such implications beyond. Indeed, you can see in both cases, this is one of the best case studies where the diaspora of the two sides are probably more influential than the local. So it is the diaspora that support the Israeli side, which mobilizes huge resources and influence uh, and commitment to all sorts of uh, processes and developments which entrench the position of their side, but equally so, there's the diaspora of the Palestinians. Most Palestinians, of course, live outside Palestine for reasons of exile, refugee status, and the, and the nature of the conflict. And, uh, of course, are aligned to a Muslim Arab world which felt under threat, not valued, not respected, and all the things that you know already. So my counterpoint here of these two pictures, one is you can see that inevitably, the, the pursuit of peace in Palestine was by a global leadership approach. And it, here is President uh, then Clinton and uh, the two, two leaders at the local level, but actually they came together and constructed a means of coexisting that set out in the uh, peace process, la labeled the 
um, Oslo Accords principally, even though the agreements were made in Washington and in the countryside outside Washington. But essentially what this peace process did was set a, 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 a mechanism by which the two sides could accommodate one another over a period of time. And a, a roadmap was set out in which uh, lots of things were supposed to happen. On the right, you'll see yours truly in a younger age, looking fitter and more agile than now. Um, but I was part of the team which was trying to implement these. And the biggest lesson that I learned, uh, looking back now, but then, was that there was very little relationship between these two at all. The peace process that had taken place on the world stage in the media, in the glaze of the media, um, with presidents chatting around cups of mint tea, rarely uh, penetrated down to the reality on the ground. And the, a great failure of leadership around this era, and this is an era around the end of uh, the 1990s, 1990, 1997, 98, 99, that sort of period, a period of great hope, which subsequent history shows that um, uh, ran out quite quickly and is now in a much more traumatized state. But the reality was that there was very little engagement of the stakeholders at the very local level to the discussions that were going on on the world stage. And you go back to our checklist of eight things that leadership should be doing. Well, there was very little empathy, very little learning. And um, this picture <coughs> with President Arafat was at my leaving do after 10 months of working with the Palestinians, um, during which time the, the work had been very intense and, and actually trying to backfill agreements that had apparently been made at a, national, uh, at a global level. The um, very, very frustrating and very little um, sensitivity by the global leadership, any of them, whether they were um, presidents on either side of the conflict or the world leaders, to the plight of ordinary people, be they ordinary Israelis or ordinary Palestinians living in the region. So how adaptive leadership would have helped would have been that the agreement that was made that became an event you see the picture on the left. This is an event. This is, a, of course, a remarkable event, a moment in history when people get together and sign up the detail, sign off the high level agreement. When that becomes a movement, a continuing process of dialogue, then it has much more likely to succeed. And that means a process of leadership which must combine the global leaders and the presidential moments with the teams of uh, strategists and workers at a local level. I often describe one anecdote, because it's a very powerful one for me, of when I was working. At the time, I was working in a team um, led by Moratinos, who was a European, former Spanish um, foreign minister, who was appointed to lead the, the, the peace accords on behalf of the European uh, community, European Union. And uh, he assembled the president and his team. In fact, the president rarely attended because he was felt to be too vulnerable to assassination. So he sent his best team and uh, to a discussion with the Israelis over water rights. Water is a critical part of the intractable conflict between the two sites because ownership of the water, which is in very specific places in the Palestinian-Israeli geography, was a critical part of peace, a critical part of prosperity and growth, and hence uh, very important. And at the peace meeting, there was a, within the Oslo Accords, there was a pattern, a picture, a roadmap at which water rights would be discussed eventually. And they were, and I was a young economist, was part of that team. When we got to the meeting, we discovered, or Moratinos discovered, the leader of the Europeans, that the Israelis had maps, had satellite imageries, they knew exactly where the water was, and the Palestinians had nothing. They, had, they didn't have science and the uh, uh, technology to be able to identify exactly where. They went on hearsay. It was about how Abu Hamas and his family knew where the water was at the back of the house. You know, It was simple as that. 
And Moratinos was a great adaptive leader. I didn't, of course, label him like that at that time. He turned around and said, we cannot come to agreement on water unless both sides have access to the same information. Fundamental, this, this about the asymmetry of power and this, the symmetry of data that's needed for peace. You could write a book about it now, but I sat and watched as he, as a European diplomat, argued with the Israelis, took the maps, went to the hotel Xerox machine, copied them and walked them along to the bedrooms of Erekat, the Palestinian negotiator. That happened in reality, not in the sort of picture of presidential agreements, but how to make peace work. This was a very good example of adaptive leadership. You take the maps from one side, you Xerox them and you give them to the other. You hadn't actually came to come to an agreement, but at least you had the basis of a sustainable agreement. There are many other cases and you might want to ask more about the experience of working there. Um, the most important one in terms of adaptive leadership lessons is the emotional problems. Most peace processes are presented, my left hand picture, presidential as rational, sensible things. But when you work at the front line, peace processes are emotional. And I'll come on to that when we look at the next case. So history took me to a different geography. By 2004, I was based in Indonesia. Um, and this, my first visit to Aceh in northern Sumatra, this is what I saw, the picture on the right. The only thing left standing in this whole uh, geography, this is a city. This is a very complex, busy city of uh, several million people lived in the broader Aceh. Uh, and the only thing left standing by the beach here was the mosque. Interestingly, it was the only thing that was built with proper cement that hadn't been subject to fraud and corruption in the cement markets and so forth. It's really interesting um, anecdote, I suppose, related to that. But the tsunami came in Boxing Day of 2004, and it came at a time when the, the conflict between the Achenese secessionists, who were much more conservative with their religion, but also fiercely anti-Java, Java, typical capital city syndrome within Indonesia, very complex country, 300 tribes, uh, an, an archipelago of different communities which were brought together only 60 or 70 years before in, in the Indonesian independence. It had been the product of European colonial powers before then, <clears throat> the Dutch, actually not all Europe, the Dutch, the Japanese and, and ourselves, the British. Its newfound independence was fine for most Indonesians, but not for those who were fiercely independent in their own communities. So the Achenese civil war against the uh, Javanese government um, was pretty, pretty brutal and, pre and had been going on for some time. A, there weren't any major resources here, so the world powers aren't really that interested in it, but they were interested in the stability of Southeast Asia generally particularly in the post-Vietnam War era and the emergence of China as a major power. So in all our lessons about adaptive leadership, there are plenty of cases here and plenty of read across to global, but actually this is a much more local thing. And uh, overnight, the, the, the tsunami, this huge wave from a, uh, came, it killed about 250,000 people in 20 minutes. It left communities completely distraught. Um, I couldn't find all the pictures I wanted to, um, but there are wonderful pictures of how the wave cut straight through the city. On the left hand side, it would be totally normal. On the right, completely destroyed as this is. This is not after clear up by the way, this was, this is a picture I took not, not six or seven days after the tsunami. So powerful was the wave, it just swept everything and cleaned it behind. Um, the other images are of the before and after. The, the, the one that's very military showed the intensity engagement of ordinary people in the, in the fight for independence, um, down to women and children. 
and it was a very much a community-led uh, <coughs> um, civil war. And at the top, the success of the international community generally at trying to mobilize positive peace in the light of the uh, disaster that affected everyone in the same way. So these are people, uh, these are young women mainly celebrating um, their, uh, their ind not independence, but their pseudo independence because the peace process in actually, of which we needn't go into the details, but if you're interested, you can of course research that, um, has left a significant de devolved power. Um, but the adaptive leadership, the agility and uh, empathy that was that came was brought about by this huge um, natural disaster. So the Achenese couldn't sort themselves out following that without broader help from the global community, but also from Indonesian. And the Indonesians uh, are an amazingly empathetic and warm people. So the Javanese and the, those from Sulawesi and other parts of Indonesia who saw what had happened all of a sudden melted into some national support and the transformation of um, uh, the context. Now, now, it's really interesting to see. Of course, we would expect that as humankind following a, a natural disaster of that magnitude. But there are lessons there, aren't there? That if you can try and develop a clear understanding of common benefits, of common interests, of shared goals and shared uh, ambitions, then you can mobilize perhaps a more likely peace. The peace has been fragile since. There's lots, lots written about how it failed before because it wasn't empathetic and because it was no assessment of win-win, always win-loss. The Javanese, uh, the dictatorship in as it was in the early years up until 2004, was just going to Im impose power as the same regime had done in the eastern part in Papua. So uh, what happened was a transformation of the context through events because of the tsunami, but an amazing assessment, a reassessment of relationships between the two. The interesting also is that the rebuilding of Ache has required a huge migration of workers, families from other parts of Indonesia, and a much more eclectic and diverse community has emerged. But in its devolution, there has, there has emerged also uh, patterns of very conservative Islam, of Sharia law, and of practices in the north of Sumatra, which are less familiar in other parts of Indonesia. But a classic case of where adaptive leadership, in this case, the adaption forced by a major event, a major natural event, can share, shed light on what is a successful or likely more successful approach to resolving difference and conflict. Let's move to the next slide. And again, I would not um, at all claim any role in working in peace building in Northern Ireland, but I was involved in some community projects around the development of more peaceful communities. And I, I did observe, because I'm a nosy sort of person, what was going on. And I, I spoke, of course, to many people as we do. On, on the left is a part of the story that I wanted to highlight, a part of the story of peace building in, in the north of Ireland, which is a 300 year old, of course, journey. This isn't something that just erupted and needed to be resolved. And on the right, the new graffiti about Brexit, Irish seaboarder Sandy Rowe says no. So what's going on here? There are many, many, many lessons. The first adaptive leadership has to assess continuously the context of uh, circumstance. And the, the images on this slide contrast two very different types of uh, context. In the first, it is known, although it's not known clearly how important it was, but it was nonetheless important, that ordinary people in the north of Ireland, particularly women, mothers, sisters, 
aunties, grandmothers got really, really tired of the destructive consequences of conflict and particularly the loss of men and the loss of boys, either to death or to injury or to imprisonment. And there's a, a very strong um, graffiti uh, community, of course, graffiti culture in, in the city of Belfast, particularly, and in London, Derry, in Derry, um, at which people was, were writing, saying, look, enough's enough. And uh, the women of the north of Ireland are often uh, pointed to as the critical factor that changed the pattern and development of the process. Many other things happened, as we know, and I could have had pictures, as I had with Palestine, of world leaders flying in and, 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 and doing really, really powerfully positive things. I don't understate them at all. But in adaptive leadership, it says it wasn't about world leaders. It was about a leadership process which embraced the whole, not parts. And a very important part of this is the resilience of communities who, at the end of the day, said that peace, positive peace, peace for its own sake, is better. It's better for jobs, it's better for children, it's better for our futures. And there's some lovely, lovely emotions in the black and white picture, aren't there, of women in the north of Ireland who, uh, in this particular case, are celebrating a breakthrough for the Good Friday Agreements. Um, and this is all at risk again if we don't apply adaptive leadership now and recognise that the context in the north of Ireland is significantly affected by things nothing to do with the conflict in Northern Ireland, namely the extrication of the United Kingdom from its trading relationships with the European Union. And the stakes are very, very high in this regard. So enough of my three cases. There's so much material in there that if you begin to think about it and read it around, I hope it's quite compelling towards the principles, the eight principles that I highlighted. Let's move on. This I showed you last time, and I think it's really, really uh, good at capturing in two dimensions some of the issues that I've, I've, I've seen. The notion that you can have a more or less complex situations and easier and hard um, positions and how the different quadrants give you different assessments. When I look back at my experience in Ramallah in the Palestinian issue, it's very clearly that people didn't appreciate how much expertise was needed and didn't appreciate how complex the relationships were with local, with diaspora and with resources. I think it was underestimated entirely. And I think much of the peace process that I lived through at that time was thought to be straightforward if world leaders could sit and agree with each other. I mean, the, the great leaders that did sit down and agree, two of them were assassinated. Um, uh, and the other one uh, was only in his job for, 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 for eight years, because that's the nature of US presidents. So I'm going to draw my final conclusions, just another bullet points or another numbered list. There are, there are five things which very clearly from the cases I've shared with you, I've drawn together in terms of what I call leadership for peace and the qualities that seem to work best. Um, the first, a non-negotiable commitment to an ethical approach. It was when people wanted to be fair and respectful of the plight of Palestinian uh, refugees and of the conditions, the health conditions in Gaza and others, that the good parts of the peace process were able to unlock. Um, inclusive and representative of all stakeholders. When the women and their voice was heard, it became a compelling reason for male politicians to sit down and agree in the north of Ireland. An ability to listen, hear and reflect on conversations in the public square. The early uh, mobilisation of support to, in Aceh after the tsunami, I went up for the British uh, embassy four days after, and we spent the first um, week 
in this terrible place, I'd never experienced anything of this kind. Listening, hearing and reflecting. And people were talking about two bad things. One was the civil war that was before the tsunami and of course still there until it was resolved. And secondly, this uh, terrible wave. And of all the things I heard, it was the power of religion behind that. Not a religion that was antagonistic to those without or those of a different faith, but most of these communities, the civilians particularly in Ache that I met, told me this was God's will and that God had found a way of resolving the uh, conflagration of the civil war. Quite bizarre, but I tell you, it was a very powerful observation. Had we thought about that, had not we, had leadership thought about that before, then there is a case for saying that peace can be built around the promotion of common values and common interests, as I said earlier. Fourthly, the leadership that mobilizes multi-generational solidarity and continuous learning and, and full engagement. Leadership that doesn't ignore young people, that doesn't ignore poor people, that doesn't ignore marginalized people is more likely to generate peace because those marginalized are those that come back and bite you when they get angry that the peace has left them behind. Um, and that's a really powerful case in all three of my case studies. And finally, the leadership that is defined by asking questions and not mobilizing around preconceived answers seems to work better. So waging peace, as we said last time, and I think it's, it's true from these cases as well, sharp reminder that structures adapt. Structure shouldn't lead, it should be behaviors and culture that matter and adaptive leadership that can change the rules in order to accommodate changes in behaviour and culture. That's it. Thank you very much.